Chapter Six of Love Insurance by Earl Durr Biggers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Six: Ten Minutes of Agony. All I ask, Mister Harrowby, is that you consent to a short interview with your brother. Mister Trimmer was speaking. The time was noon of the following day, and Trimmer faced Lord Harrowby in the sitting room of his lordship's hotel suite also present at harrowby's invitation were martin wall and mr minot his lordship turned his gray eyes on trimmer's eager face he could make those eyes fishy when he liked he made them so now he is not my brother he said coldly and i shall not see him may i ask you not to call me mr harrowby you may ask till you're red in your noble face replied trimmer firm in his disrespect but i shall go on calling you mister just the same i call you that because i know the facts just as i call your poor cheated brother who was in this hotel last night between sandwich boards lord harrowby really said his lordship i see no occasion for prolonging this interview mr trimmer leaned forward he was a big man but his face was incongruously thin almost axe-like the very best sort of face to thrust in anywhere and trimmer was the very man to do the thrusting without batting an eye do you deny he demanded with the air of a prosecutor that you had an older brother by the name of george i certainly do not answered lord harrowby george ran off to america some twenty-two years ago he died in a mining camp in arizona twelve years back there is no question whatever about that we had it on the most reliable authority a lot of lies said trimmer can be had on good authority this situation illustrates that do you think mr harrowby that i'd be wasting my time on this proposition if i wasn't dead sure of my facts why poor old george has the evidence in his possession incontrovertible proofs it wouldn't hurt you to see him and look over what he has to offer your lordship minot suggested you know that i am your friend and that my great desire is to see you happily married next week in order that nothing may happen to prevent i think you ought to see this impostor cut in his lordship haughtily no i cannot this is not the first time adventurers have questioned the harrowby title the dignity of our family demands that i refuse to take any notice whatsoever go on sneered trimmer hide behind your dignity when i get through with you you won't have enough left to conceal your stick pen trimmer said martin wall speaking for the first time how much money do you want mr trimmer kept his temper admirably your society has not corrupted me mr wall he said sweetly i am not a blackmailer i am simply a publicity man i'm working on a salary which lord harrowby the real lord harrowby is to pay me when he comes into his own i've handled successfully and publicity campaigns prima donnas pills erasers perfumes holding companies race horses soups and society leaders it isn't likely that i shall fall down on this proposition for the last time mr allan harrowby will you see your brother lord harrowby if i were you minot began my dear fellow his lordship raised one slim hand it is quite impossible which i take it terminates our talk with mr trimmer yes said mr trimmer rising except for one thing our young friend here when he urges you to grant my request is giving a correct imitation of a wise head on youthful shoulders he's an american and he knows about me about henry trimmer i guess you never heard mr harrowby what i did for cottrell's ink eraser come on said mr wall militantly erase yourself for the moment i will 
smiled mr trimmer you're going to be sorry you aren't up against any piker in publicity no siree that little sandwich board stunt of mine last night was just a starter i'm going to take the public into partnership put it up to the people that's my motto good day sir snapped lord harrowby put it up to the people and when i pull off the little trick i thought of this morning you're going to get down before me on your noble knees and beg off i warn you good day gentlemen and may i add one simple request on parting watch trimmer he went out slamming the door behind him mr wall rose and walked rapidly toward a decanter rather tough talk on you lord harrowby he remarked pouring himself a drink especially just now the fresh bounder ought to have been kicked out of the room an impostor snorted harrowby a rank impostor of course mr wall set down his glass but don't worry if trimmer gets too obstreperous i'll take care of him myself i guess i'll be going back to the yacht after wall's departure minot and harrowby sat staring at each other for a long moment see here your lordship said minot at last you know why i'm in san marco that wedding next tuesday must take place without fail and i can't say that i approve of your action just now my dear boy harrowby interrupted soothingly i appreciate your position but there was nothing to be gained by seeing mr trimmer's friend the meyricks were distressed naturally by that ridiculous sandwich board affair last evening but they have made no move to call off the wedding on account of it the best thing to do i'm sure is to let matters take their own course i might be able to prove that chap's claims false but and then again i mightn't even if i knew they were false and there is a third possibility what is that he might really be george but you said your brother died twelve years ago that is what we heard but one cannot be sure and delighted as i should be to know that george is alive naturally i should prefer to know it after next tuesday anger surged into minot's heart is that fair to the young lady who who is to become my wife lord harrowby waved his hand it is miss myrick is not marrying me for my title as for her father and aunt i cannot be so sure i want no disturbance you want none i am sure it is better to let things take their course all right said minot only i intend to do everything in my power to put this wedding through my dear chap your cause is mine answered his lordship minot returned to the narrow confines of his room on the bureau where he had thrown it earlier in the day lay an invitation to dine that night with mrs bruce thus was jack paddock's hand shown the dinner was to be in miss meyrick's honor and mr minot was not sorry he was to go he took up the invitation and reread it smilingly so he was to hear mrs bruce at her own table the wittiest hostess in san marco bar none the drowsiness of a florida midday was in the air mr minot lay down on his bed a hundred thoughts were his the brown of miss meyrick's eyes the sincerity of mr trimmer's voice when he spoke of his proposition the fishy look of lord harrowby refusing to meet his long-lost brother things grew hazy mr minot slept on leaving lord harrowby's rooms mr martin wall did not immediately set out for the lilith on which he lived in preference to the hotel instead he took a brisk turn about the spacious lobby of the de la pax people turned to look at him as he passed they noted that his large placid rather jovial face was lighted by an eye sharp and queer and a bit out of place amid its surroundings mr wall considered himself the true cosmopolite and his history rather bore out the boast many and odd were the lands that had known him he had loaned money to a prince of algiers on excellent security broken bread with a sultan 
organized a baseball nine in cuba and coming home from the east via the indian ports had flirted on shipboard with the wife of a russian grand duke as he passed through that cool lobby it was not to be wondered at that middle west merchants and their wives found him worthy of a second glance the courtyard of the hotel de la pax was fringed by a series of modish shops with doors opening both on the courtyard and on the narrow street outside among these occupying a corner room was the very smart jewel shop of osby and blake occasionally in the winter resorts of the south one may find jewelry shops whose stock would bear favorably competition with fifth avenue osby and blake conducted such an establishment for a moment before the show window of this shop mr wall paused and with the eye of a connoisseur studied the brilliant display within his whole manner changed the air of boredom with which he had surveyed his fellow travellers of the lobby disappeared on the instant he was alert alive almost eager jauntily he strolled into the store one clerk only a tall thin man with a sallow complexion and hair the colour of a lemon was in charge mr wall asked to be shown the stock of unset diamonds the trays that the man set before him caused the eyes of mr wall to brighten still more with a manner almost reverent he stooped over and passed his fingers lovingly over the stones for an instant the tall man glanced outside and smiled a sallow smile a little girl in a pink dress was crossing the street and it was at her that he smiled there's a flaw in that stone said mr wall in a voice of sorrow see from outside came the came the shrill scream of a child interrupting the tall man turned quickly to the window my god he moaned what is it mr wall sought to look over his shoulder automobile my little girl cried the clerk in agony he turned to martin wall hesitating his sallow face was white now his lips trembled doubtfully he gazed into the frank open countenance of martin wall and then i'll leave you in charge he shouted and fled past mr wall to the street for a moment martin wall stood frozen to the spot his eyes were unbelieving his little cupid's bow mouth wide open here come back he shouted when he could find his voice no one heeded no one heard outside in the street a crowd had gathered martin wall wet his dry lips with his tongue an unaccountable shudder swept his huge frame my god he cried in a voice of terror i'm alone for the first time he dared to move his oboe bumped a hundred thousand dollars worth of unset diamonds frightened he drew back he collided with a showcase rich in emeralds rubies and aquamarines he put out a plump hand to steady himself it rested on a display case of french russian and dutch silver mr wall's knees grew weak he felt a strange prickly sensation all over him he took a step and was staring at the finest display of black pearls south of maiden lane new york quickly he turned away his eyes fell upon the door of a huge safety vault it was swinging open little beads of perspiration began to pop out on the forehead of martin wall his heart was hammering like that of a youth who sees after a long separation his lady love his eyes grew glassy he took out a silk handkerchief and passed it slowly across his damp forehead staggering slightly he stepped again to the trays of unset stones the glassy eyes had grown greedy now he put out one huge hand as the lover aforesaid might reach toward his lady's hair then mr wall shut his lips firmly and thrust both of his hands deep into his trousers pockets he stood there in the middle of that gorgeous room a fat figure of a man suffering a cruel inhuman agony he was still standing thus when the tall man came running back apprehension clouded that sallow face it was very kind of you the small eyes of the clerk darted everywhere then came back to martin wall i'm obliged why what's the matter sir 
martin wall passed his hand across his eyes as a man banishing a terrible dream the little girl he asked hardly a scratch said the clerk pointing to the smiling child at his side it was lucky wasn't it he was behind the counter now studying the trays unprotected on the showcase very lucky martin wall still had to steady himself perhaps you'd like to look about a bit before i go oh no sir everything's all right i'm sure you were looking at these stones some other time said wall weakly i only wanted an idea of what you had good day sir and thank you very much not at all and the limp ex-guardian passed unsteadily from the store into the glare of the street mr tom stacy of the manhattan club half dozing on the veranda of his establishment was rejoiced to see his old friend martin wall crossing the pavement toward him well martin he began and then a look of concern came into his face good lord man what ails you mr wall sat like a wet rag to the steps tom he said a terrible thing has just happened i was left alone in ostby and blake's jewelry shop alone cried mr stacy you alone absolutely alone mr stacy leaned over are you leaving town in a hurry he asked gloomily mr wall shook his head he put me on my honor he complained left me in charge of the shop can you beat it of course after that i well you know somehow i couldn't do it i tried but i couldn't mr stacy threw back his head and his raucous laughter smote the lazy summer afternoon i can't help it he gasped the funniest thing i ever you the best stone thief in america alone in charge of three million dollars worth of the stuff good heavens man whispered wall not so loud and well might he protest for mr stacy's indiscreet and mirthful tone carried far it carried for example to mr richard minot standing hidden behind the curtains of his little room overhead come inside martin said stacy come inside and have a bracer you sure must need it after that i do replied mr wall in heartfelt tones he rose and followed tom stacy cheeks burning eyes popping mr minot watched them disappear into the manhattan club here was news indeed lord harrowby's boon companion the ablest jewel thief in america just what did that mean putting on coat and hat he hurried to the hotel office and there wrote a cablegram situation suspicious are you dead certain h is on the level an hour later in his london office mr jephson read this message carefully three times End of chapter six chapter seven of love insurance by earl der biggers this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter seven chain lightning's collar the villa jasmine mrs bruce's winter home stood in a park of palms and shrubbery some two blocks from the hotel de la pax mr minot walked thither that evening in the resplendent company of jack paddock you'll enjoy mrs bruce to-night paddock confided i've done her some rather good lines if i do say it as shouldn't on what topics asked minot with a smile international marriage jewels by the way i don't suppose you know that miss cynthia myrick is to appear for the first time wearing the famous harrowby necklace i didn't even know there was a necklace minot returned ah such ignorance but then you don't wander much in feminine society do you mrs bruce told me about it this morning chain lightning's color chain lightning's what ah my boy mr paddock lighted a cigarette you should go round more in royal circles list commoner while i relate 
it seems that the earl of raybrook is a giddy old sport with a gambling streak a yard wide in his young days he loved the lady evelyn holloway lady evelyn had a horse entered in a derby about that time name chain lightning and the earl of raybrook wagered a diamond necklace against a kiss that chain lightning would lose wasn't that giving big odds inquired minot not if you believe the stories of lady evelyn's beauty well it happened before tammany politicians began avenging ireland on derby day chain lightning won and the earl came across with the necklace afterward he married lady evelyn to get back the necklace cynic and being a rather racy old boy he referred to the necklace thereafter as chain lightning's collar it got to be pretty well known in england by that name i believe it is considered a rather neat piece of jewellery among the english nobility whose sparklers aren't what they were before the steel business in pittsburgh turned out a good thing chain lightning's collar mused minot i presume lady evelyn was the mother of the present lord harrowby so tis rumoured smiled paddock though i take it his lordship favours his father in looks they walked along for a moment in silence the story of this necklace of diamonds could bring but one thing to minot's thoughts martin wall drooping on the steps of the manhattan club while old stacy roared with joy he considered should he tell mr paddock no he decided he would wait as i said paddock ran on you'll enjoy mrs bruce tonight her lines are good but somehow it's really a great problem to me she doesn't sound human and natural when she gets them off i looked up her beauty doctor and asked him if he couldn't put a witty gleam in her eye but he told me he didn't care to go that far in correcting mrs bruce's maker they had reached the villa jasmine now a great white palace in a flowery setting more like a dream than a reality the evening breeze murmured whisperingly through the palms a hundred gorgeous colors shone in the moonlight fountains splashed coolly amid the greenery act two muttered minot the ground surrounding the castle of the fairy princess you have to come down here don't you replied paddock to realize that old mother nature has a little on belasco after all the whir of a motor behind them caused the two young men to turn then mr minot saw her coming up the path toward him coming up that fantastic avenue of palms tall fair white a lovely figure in a lovely setting ah yes lord harrowby he walked at her side nonchalant distinguished almost as tall as a popular illustrator thinks a man in evening clothes should be truly they made a handsome couple they were to wed mr minot himself had sworn they were to wed he kept the bitterness from his tone as he greeted them there amid the soft magic of the florida night together they went inside in the centre of a magnificent hallway they found mrs bruce standing like stout cortez on his darien peak triumphant amid the glory of her gold mr minot thought mrs bruce's manner of greeting somewhat harried and oppressed poor lady every function was a first night for her would the glare of the footlights frighten her would she falter in her lines forget them completely only her sisters of the stage could sympathize with her understandingly now so you are to carry cynthia away minot heard her saying to lord harrowby such a lot of my friends have married into the peerage indeed i have sometimes thought you english have no other pastime save that of slipping engagement rings on hands across the sea a soft voice spoke in minot's ear mine mr paddock was saying not bad eh but look at that englishman why should i have sat up all last night writing lines to try and him can you tell me that lord harrowby indeed seemed oblivious of mrs bruce's little bon mot he hemmed and hawed and said he was a lucky man but he did not mean that he was a lucky man because he had the privilege of hearing mrs bruce mr bruce slipped out of the shadows into the weariness of another formal dinner 
mrs bruce glittered and he wrote the checks he was a scraggly little man who sometimes sat for hours at a time in silence there were those unkind enough to say that he sought back trying to recall the reason that had led him to marry mrs bruce when he beheld miss cynthia meyrick and knew that he was to take her into dinner mr bruce brightened perceptibly none save a blind and deaf man could have failed to cocktails consumed the party turned toward the dining-room except for the meyricks martin wall lord harrowby and paddock dick minot knew none of them there were a couple of colorless men from new york who when they died would be referred to as prominent club men a horsey girl from westchester an ex-ambassador's wife and daughter a number of names from boston and philadelphia with their respective bearers and last but not least the two bond girls from omaha blonde lovely but inclined to be snobbish even in that company for their mother was a van rapan and van rapans are rare birds in omaha and elsewhere mr minot took in the elder of the bond girls and found that cynthia meyrick sat on his lap he glanced at her throat as they sat down it was bare of ornament and then he beheld sparkling in her lovely hair the perfect diamonds of chain lightning's collar as he turned back to the table he caught the eye of mr martin wall mr wall's eye happened to be coming away from the same locality the girl from omaha gossiped of plays and players like a dramatic page from some old sunday newspaper i'm mad about the stage she confided of course we get all the best shows in omaha why maxine elliott and nat goodwin come there every year mr minot new yorker shuddered should he tell her of the many and active years in the lives of these two since they visited any town together no what use on the other side of him a sweet voice spoke i presume you know mr minot that mrs bruce has the reputation of being the wittiest hostess in san marco i have heard as much minot smiled into cynthia meyrick's eyes when does her act go on mrs bruce was wondering the same thing she knew her lines she was ready true she understood few of those lines wit was not her specialty until mr paddock took charge of her she had thought colored newspaper supplements humorous in the extreme however the lines mr paddock taught her seemed to go well and she continued to patronize the old stand she looked up now from her conversation with her dinner partner and silence fell as at a curtain ascending i was just saying to lord harrowby mrs bruce began smiling about her how picturesque our business streets are here what with the greek merchants in their native costumes bandits every one of them growled mr bruce bravely interrupting his wife frowned only the other day she continued i bought a rug from a man who claimed to be a persian prince he said it was a prayer rug and i think it must have been for ever since i got it i've been praying it's genuine a little ripple of amusement ran about the table the redoubtable mrs bruce was under way people spoke to one another in undertones little conversational nudges of anticipation by the way cynthia the hostess inquired have you heard from helen arden lately not for some time responded miss meyrick although i have her promise that she and the duke will be here next tuesday splendid mrs bruce turned to his lordship i think of helen lord harrowby because she too married into your nobility her father made his money in sausage in the middle west in his youth he'd had trouble in finding a pair of ready-made trousers but as soon as the money began to roll in helen started to look him up a coat of arms and a family motto i remember suggesting at the time in view of the sausage a family is no stronger than its weakest link mrs bruce knew when to pause she paused now the ripple became an outright laugh mr paddock sipped languorously from his wine-glass he saw that his lines got over 
went into society head foremost helen did mrs bruce continued thought herself a clever amateur actress used to act often for charity though i don't recall that she ever got it the beauty of mrs bruce's wit said miss myrick in mr minot's ear is that it is so unconscious she doesn't appear to realize when she has said a good thing there's just a chance that she doesn't realize it suggested minot then helen met the duke of lismore mrs bruce was speaking once more perhaps you know him lord harrowby no i'm sorry to say i don't a charming chap in some ways helen was a chavian in considering marriage the chief pursuit of women she pursued following lismore to italy where he proposed i presume he thought that being in rome he must do as the romeos do but my dear lady said harrowby in a daze isn't it the romans isn't what the romans asked mrs bruce blankly your lordship is correct said mr paddock hastily mrs bruce misquoted purposely in jest you know jibe japery oh ah uh, pardon me returned his lordship i saw helen in london last spring mrs bruce went on she confided to me that she considers her husband a genius and if genius really be nothing but an infinite capacity for taking champagnes i am sure the poor child is right little murmurs of joy and the dinner proceeded the guests bent over their food shipped to mrs bruce in a refrigerating car from new york and very little wearied by its long trip here and there two talked together it was like an intermission between the acts mr minot turned to the omaha girl even though she was two wives behind on mr nat goodwin's career one must be polite it was at the close of the dinner that mrs bruce scored her most telling point she and lord harrowby were conversing about a famous english author and when she was sure she had the attention of the table she remarked yes we met his wife at the mason bees but i have always felt that the wife of a celebrity is like the coupon on one's railway ticket how's that mrs bruce minot inquired after all paddock had been kind to him not good if detached said mrs bruce she stood her guests followed suit it was by this bon mot that she chose to have her dinner live in the gossip of san marco hence with it she closed the ceremony witty woman your wife said one of the colorless new yorkers to mr bruce when the men were left alone mr bruce only grunted but mr paddock answered brightly do you really think so yes don't you why <laughs> really mr paddock blushed modest author he a servant appeared to say that lord harrowby was wanted at once outside and excusing himself harrowby departed he found his valet a plump round-faced serious man waiting in the shadows on the veranda for a long time they talked together in low tones when harrowby returned to the dining-room his never cheerful face was even gloomier than usual spencer meyrick and bruce exiles both of them talked joyously of business and the rush of the day's work for which both longed the new york man and a sapling from boston conversed of chamber music martin wall sat silent contemplative perhaps had he spoken his thoughts they would have been of a rich jewel shop at noon deserted a half hour later mrs bruce's dinner party was scattered among the palms and flowers of her gorgeous lawn mr minot had fallen again to the elder girl from omaha and blithely for her he was displaying his broadway ignorance of horticulture suddenly out of the night came a scream instantly when he heard it mr minot knew who had uttered it unceremoniously he parted from the omaha beauty and sped over the lawn but quick as he was lord harrowby was quicker for when minot came up he saw harrowby bending over miss merrick who sat upon a wicker bench cynthia what is it harrowby was saying cynthia merrick felt wildly of her shining hair 
your necklace she gasped chain lightning's collar he took it he took it who i don't know a man a man reverent repetition by feminine voices out of the excited group he leapt out at me there by that tree pinioned my arms snatched the necklace i couldn't see his face it happened in the shadow no matter harrowby replied don't give it another thought my child but how can i help i shall telephone the police at once announced spencer myrick i beg you'll do nothing of the sort expostulated lord harrowby it would be a great inconvenience the thing wasn't worth the publicity that would result i insist that the police be kept out of this argument loud on mr myrick's part ensued suggestions galore were offered by the guests but in the end lord harrowby had his way it was agreed not to call in the police mr minot looking up saw a sneering smile on the face of martin wall in a flash he knew the truth with aunt mary calling loudly for smelling salts and the whole party more or less in confusion the return to the house started mr paddock walked at minot's side rather looks as though chain lightning's collar had choked off our gaiety he mumbled serves her right for wearing the thing in her hair she spoiled two corking lines for me by not wearing it where you'd naturally expect a necklace to be worn minot maneuvered so as to intercept lord harrowby under the portico may i speak with you a moment he inquired harrowby bowed and they stepped into the shadows of the drive lord harrowby said minot trying to keep the excitement from his voice i have certain information about one of the guests here this evening that i believe would interest you your lordship has been badly buffaloed one of our fellow diners at mrs bruce's table holds the title of the ablest jewel thief in america he watched keenly to catch lord harrowby's start of surprise alas he caught nothing of the sort nonsense said his lordship nonchalantly you mustn't let your imagination carry you away dear chap imagination nothing i know what i'm talking about and then minot added sarcastically sorry to bore you with this his lordship laughed right oh old fellow i'm not interested but haven't you just lost a diamond necklace yes they had reached a particularly dark and secluded spot beneath the canopy of palm leaves harrowby turned suddenly and put his hands on minot's shoulders mr minot he said you are here to see that nothing interferes with my marriage to miss meyrick i trust you are determined to do your duty to your employers absolutely that is why then replied harrowby quickly i am going to ask you to take charge of this for me suddenly minot felt something cold and glassy in his hand startled he looked down even in the dark chain lightning's collar sparkled like the famous toy that it was your lordship i cannot explain now i can only tell you it is quite necessary that you help me at this time if you wish to do your full duty by mr jephson who took this necklace from miss myrick's hair asked minot hotly i did i assure you it was the only way to prevent our plans from going awry please keep it until i ask you for it and turning lord harrowby walked rapidly toward the house the brute angrily mr minot stood turning the necklace over in his hand so he frightened the girl he is to marry the girl he is supposed to love what should he do go to her and tell her of harrowby's amiable eccentricities he could hardly do that harrowby had taken him into his confidence and besides there was jephson of the great bald head the peter pan eyes nothing to do but wait returning to the hotel from mrs bruce's villa he found awaiting him a cable from jephson the cable assured him that beyond any question the man in san marco was allan harrowby and like caesar's wife above suspicion yet even as he read lord harrowby walked through the lobby and at his side was mr james o'malley house detective of the hotel de la pax 
they came from the manager's office where they had evidently been closeted with the cable gram in his hand minot entered the elevator and ascended to his room the other hand was in the pocket of his topcoat closed tightly upon chain lightning's collar the bauble that the earl of raybrook had once wagered against a kiss End of chapter seven chapter eight of love insurance by earl durr biggers this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter eight after the train seals mr minot opened his eyes on thursday morning with the uncomfortable feeling that he was far from his beloved new york for a moment he lay dazed wandering in that dim borderland between sleep and waking then suddenly he remembered oh yes by jove he muttered i've been knighted groom of the backstairs scandals and keeper of the royal jewels that's me he lifted his pillow there on the white sheet sparkled the necklace of which the whole british nobility was proud chain lightning's collar some seventy-five blue-white diamonds pear-shaped perfectly graduated his for the moment what's harrowby up to i wonder he reflected the dear old top nice pleasant little party if a policeman should find this in my pocket another perfect day shone in that narrow spanish street up in manhattan theatrical press agents were crowning huge piles of snow with posters announcing their attractions ferries were held up by ice in the river a breeze from the arctic swept round the flat-iron building here lazy summer lulled on the bosom of the town in the hotel dining-room mr minot encountered jack paddock superb in white flannels above his grapefruit he accepted paddock's invitation to join him by the way said mrs bruce's jester holding up a small badly printed newspaper have you made the acquaintance of the san marco mail yet no what's that a morning newspaper by courtesy started here a few weeks back by a noiseless little spaniard from havana named manuel gonzale slept in here on his rubber shoes gonzale dead dressed all in white lovely lemon face shifty can't catch me eyes and his newspaper hot stuff my boy it has town topics looking like a consular report from greenland scandals asked mr minot also attacking a grapefruit scandals and rumors of scandals mostly hints you know several references this morning to our proud and haughty friend lord harrowby for example madame on dit writing in her column on page one as this to say the impecunious but titled englishman who has arrived in our midst recently with the idea of connecting with certain american dollars has an interesting time ahead of him if rumor speaks true the little incident in the lobby of a local hotel the other evening which was duly reported in this column at the time was but a mild beginning the gentleman in charge of the claimant to the title held so jealously by our british friend promises immediate developments which will be rich rare and racy rich rare and racy repeated minot thoughtfully ah yes we were to watch mr trimmer i had almost forgot him in the excitement of last evening by the way does the mail know anything about the disappearance of chain lightning's collar not as yet smiled mr paddock although madame on dit claims to have been a guest at the dinner by the way what do you make of last night's melodramatic farce i don't know what to make of it answered minot truthfully he was suddenly conscious of the necklace in his inside coat pocket then all i can say my dear watson replied mr paddock with burlesque seriousness is that you are unmistakably lacking in my powers of deduction give me a cigarette and i'll tell you the name of the man who is gloating over those diamonds to-day all right smiled minot go ahead mr paddock 
reaching for a match tray spoke in a low tone in minot's ear martin wall he said he leaned back you ask how i arrived at my conclusion simple enough i went through the list of guests for possible crooks and eliminated them one by one the man i have mentioned alone was left ever notice his eyes remind me of manuel gonzales he is too polished too slick too good to be true he's travelled too much nobody travels as much as he has except for the very good reason that a detective is on the trail and he made friends with simple old harrowby on an atlantic liner that if you read popular fiction is alone enough to condemn him believe me dick martin wall should be watched all right laughed minot you watch him i've a notion to harrowby makes me weary won't call in a solitary detective any one might think he doesn't want the necklace back after breakfast minot and paddock played five sets of tennis on the hotel courts and mr minot won despite the harrowby diamonds in his trousers pocket weighing him down luncheon over mr paddock suggested a drive to tarragona island a little bit of nowhere a mile offshore he said no man can ever know the true inwardness of the word lonesome until he's seen tarragona minot hesitated ought he to leave the scene of action of action he glanced about him there was less action here than in a henry james novel the tangle of events in which he was involved rested for a siesta so he and mr paddock drove along the narrow neck of land that led from the mainland to tarragona island they entered the kingdom of the lonely sandy beach with the ocean on one side swamps on the other scrubby palms disreputable foliage here and there a cluster of seemingly deserted cottages the world and its works apparently a million miles away yet out on one corner of that bleak forgotten acre stood the slim outline of a wireless and in a little white house lived a man who amid the seagulls and the sand dunes talked daily with great ships and cities far away i told you it was lonesome said mr paddock lonesome shivered minot even god has forgot this place only marconi has remembered and even as they wandered there amid the swamps where alligators and rattlesnakes alone saw fit to dwell back in san marco the capable mr trimmer was busy by poster and by handbill he was spreading word of his newest coup so that by evening no one in town save the few who were most concerned was unaware of a development rich rare and racy minot and paddock returned late and their dinner was correspondingly delayed it was eight thirty o'clock when they at last strolled into the lobby of the de la pax there they encountered miss meyrick her father and lord harrowby we're taking harrowby to the movies said miss meyrick he confesses he's never been won't you come along she was one of her gay cells to-night white slim laughing irresistible minot looking at her thought that she could make even tarragona island bearable he knew of no greater tribute to her charm the girl and harrowby led the way and minot and paddock followed with spencer merrick the old man was an imposing figure in his white serge which accentuated the floridness of his face he talked of an administration that did not please him of a railroad fallen on evil days now and again he paused and seemed to lose the thread of what he was saying while his eyes dwelt on his daughter walking ahead they arrived shortly at the san marco opera house devoted each evening to three acts of refined vaudeville and six of the newest film releases it was here that the rich loitering in san marco found their only theatrical amusement and forgetting broadway laughed and were thrilled with simpler folk a large crowd was fairly fighting to get in and mr paddock who volunteered to buy the tickets was forced to take his place at the end of a long line finally they reached the dim interior of the opera house 
and were shown to seats far down in front by hanging back in the dusk minot managed to secure the end seat with miss meyrick at his side beyond her sat lord harrowby gazing with rapt british seriousness at the humorous film that was being flashed on the screen between pictures harrowby offered an opinion you in america are a jolly lot he said just fancy our best people in england attending a cinematograph exhibition they tried to fancy it but with his lordship there they couldn't two more pictures ran their filmy lengths while mr minot sat entranced there in the half dark it was not the pictures that entranced him rather was it a lady's nearness the flash of her smile the hundred and one tones of her voice all all again as it had been in that ridiculous automobile just before the awakening after the third picture the lights of the auditorium were turned up and the hour of vaudeville arrived on to the stage strolled a pert confident youth garbed in shabby grandeur who attempted sidewalk repartee he clipped his jests from barber-shop periodicals bought his songs from an ex-barroom songwriter and would have gone to the mat with anyone who denied that his act was refined mr minot listening to his jibes thought of the paddock jest factory and mrs bruce when the young man had rung the last encore from a kindly audience the drop curtain was raised and revealed on the stage in gleaming splendor captain ponsonby's troop of trained seals an intelligent aggregation they proved balancing balls on their small heads juggling flaming torches and taking as their just due lumps of sugar from the captain's hand as they finished each feat the audience recalled them again and again and even the peerage was captivated clever beasts aren't they lord harrowby remarked and as captain ponsonby took his final curtain his lordship added um what follows the dream seals the answer to harrowby's query came almost immediately and a startling answer it proved to be into the glare of the footlights stepped mr henry trimmer his manner was that of the conquering hero for a moment he stood smiling and bowing before the approving multitude then he raised a hand commanding silence my dear friends he said i appreciate this reception as i said in my handbill of this afternoon i am working in the interests of justice the gentleman who accompanies me to your delightful little city is beyond any question whatsoever george harrowby the eldest son of the earl of raybrook and as such he is entitled to call himself lord harrowby i know the american people well enough to feel sure that when they realize the facts they will demand that justice be done that is why i have prevailed upon lord harrowby to meet you here in this your temple of amusement and put his case before you his lordship will talk to you for a time with a view of getting acquainted he has chosen for the subject of his discourse the old days at rigdale hall ladies and gentlemen i have the honor to introduce the real lord harrowby out of the wind shuffled the lean and gloomy englishman whom mr trimmer had snatched from the unknown to cloud a certain wedding day the applause burst forth it shook the building from the gallery descended a shrill penetrating whistle of acclaim mr minot glanced at the face of the girl beside him she was looking straight ahead her cheeks bright red her eyes flashing with anger beyond the face of harrowby loomed frozen terrible shall we go minot whispered by no means the girl answered we should only call attention to our presence here i know at least fifty people in this audience we must see it through the applause was stilled at last and supremely fussed the real lord harrowby faced that friendly throng dear and people he said as mr trimmer has told you we seek only justice i am not here to argue my right to the title i claim that i can do at the proper time and place i am simply proposing to go back back into the past many years 
back to the days when i was a boy at rakedale hall i shall picture those days as no impostor could picture them and when i have done i shall allow you to judge and there in that crowded little southern opera house on that hot february night the actor who followed the trained seals proceeded to go back with unfaltering touch he sketched for his audience the great stone country seat called rakedale hall where for centuries the harrowbys had dwelt it was as though he took his audience there to visit through the massive iron gates up the broad avenue bordered with limes until the high chimneys the pointed gables the mullioned windows and the walls half hidden by ivy creeping roses and honeysuckles were revealed to them he took them through the house to the servants quarters which he called the offices out into the kitchen gardens thence to the paved quadrangle of the stables with its arched gateway and the chiming clock above tennis courts grape houses conservatories they visited breathlessly they saw over the brow of the hill the low square tower of the old church and the chimneys of the vicar's modest house and far away they beheld the trees that furnished cover to the little beast it was the earl of raybrook's pleasure to hunt in the season becoming more specific he spoke of the neighbors and a bit of romance crept in the person of the fair-haired honourable edith townshend who lived to the west of rakedale hall he described at length the picturesque personality of the racing parson neighbour on the south and in full accord with the ideas of the sporting earl of raybrook the events of his youth he said crowded back upon him as he recalled this happy scene and emotion well nigh choked him however he managed to tell of a few of the celebrities who came to dinner of their bon mots, their preferences in cuisine he mentioned the thrilling morning when he was nearly drowned in the brook that skirted the purple meadow also the thrilling afternoon when he hid his mother's famous necklace in the biscuit box on the sideboard and upset a whole household and he narrated a dozen similar exploits each garnished with small illuminating details his audience sat fascinated all who listened felt that his words rang true even lord harrowby himself sitting far forward his hand gripping the seat in front of him until the white of his knuckles showed through next the speaker shifted his scene to eton thrilled his hearers with the story of his revolt against oxford of his flight to the states his wild days in arizona and he pulled out of his pocket a letter written by the old earl of raybrook himself profanely expostulating with him for his madness and begging that he return to ascend to the earldom when the old man was no more the real lord harrowby finished reading this somewhat pathetic appeal with a little break in his voice and stood looking out at the audience if my brother allan himself were in the house he said he would have to admit that it is our father speaking in that letter a rustle of interest ran through the auditorium the few who had recognized harrowby turned to stare at him now for a moment he sat silent his face a variety of colors in the dim light then with a cry of rage he leapt to his feet you stole that letter you cur he cried you are a liar a fraud an impostor the man on the stage stood shading his eyes with his hand ah oh, alan he answered so you are here after all is that quite the proper greeting after all these years a roar of sympathetic applause greeted this sally there was no doubt as to whose side mr trimmer's friend the public was on harrowby stood in his place his lips twitching his eyes for once blazing and angry dick minot was by this time escorting miss meyrick up the aisle and they came quickly to the cool street harrowby paddock and spencer meyrick followed immediately his lordship was most contrite a thousand pardons he pleaded really i can't tell you how sorry i am cynthia to have made you conspicuous what was i thinking of but he maddened me i 
don't worry ellen said miss meyrick gently i like you the better for being maddened old spencer meyrick said nothing but minot noted that his face was rather red and his eyes were somewhat dangerous they all walked back to the hotel in silence from the hotel lobby as if by prearrangement harrowby followed miss meyrick and her father into a parlor minot and paddock were left alone my word old top said mr paddock facetiously a rough night for the nobility what do you think that lad's story sounded like a little bit of all right to me eh what it did sound convincing returned the troubled minot but then a servant at rakedale hall could have concocted it mayhap said mr paddock however old spencer meyrick looked to me like a volcano i'd want to get out from under poor old harrowby i'm afraid there's a rift within the loot nay no loot at all jack said minot firmly that wedding has got to take place why what's it to you it happens to be everything but keep it under your hat great scott does harrowby owe you money i can't explain just at present jack oh very well replied mr paddock but take it from me old man she's a million times too good for him a million laughed mr minot bitterly you underestimate paddock stood staring with wonder at his friend you lisp in riddles my boy he said do i returned minot maybe some day i'll make it all clear he parted from paddock and ascended to the third floor as he wandered through the dark passageways in search of his room he bumped suddenly into a heavy man walking softly something about the contour of the man in the dark gave him a suggestion good evening mr wall he said the scurry of hurrying footsteps but no answer minot went on to three eight nine and placed his key in the lock it would not turn he twisted the knob of the door it was unlocked he stepped inside and flashed on the light his small abode was in a mad disorder the chiffonier drawers had been emptied on the floor the bed was torn to pieces the rug thrown in a corner minot smiled to himself someone had been searching searching for a chain lightning's collar who who but the man he had bumped against in that dark passageway End of chapter eight chapter nine of love insurance by earl durr biggers this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine wanted board and room as dick minot bent over to pick up his scattered property a knock sounded on the half-open door and lord harrowby trooped in the nobleman was gloom personified he threw himself despondently down on the bed minot old chap he drawled it's all over his eyes took in the wreckage eh what the deuce have you been doing old boy i haven't been doing anything minot answered but others have been busy while we were at the um, theatre fawn fingers have been searching for chain lightning's collar the devil you haven't lost it no not yet i believe minot took the envelope from his pocket and drew out the gleaming necklace ah it's still safe harrowby leapt from the bed and slammed shut the door dear old boy he cried keep the accursed thing in your pocket no one must see it i say who's been searching here do you think it could have been o'malley what is o'malley's interest in your necklace some other time please sorry to inconvenience you with the thing do hang on to it won't you awful mix-up if you didn't bad mix-up as it is as i said when i came in it's all over what's all over everything the marriage my chance for happiness minot i'm a most unlucky chap meyrick has just postponed the wedding in a frightfully loud tone of voice postponed it sad news for jephson this yet as he spoke mr minot felt a thrill of joy in his heart he smiled the pleasantest smile he had so far shown san marco exactly he was fearfully rattled was meyrick my word how he did go on considers his daughter 
humiliated by the antics of that creature we saw on the stage to-night can't say i blame him either the wedding is definitely postponed unless that impostor is removed from the scene immediately oh unless said minot his heart sank his smile vanished unless was the word i fancy said harrowby blinking wisely lord harrowby minot began you intimated the other day that this man might really be your brother no harrowby broke in impossible i got a good look at the chap to-night he's no more a harrowby than you are you give me your word for that absolutely even after twenty years of america no harrowby would drag his father's name on to the vaudeville stage no he is an impostor and as such he deserves no consideration whatever and by the by minot you will note that the postponement is through no fault of mine minot made a wry face i have noted it he said in other words i go on to the stage now following the man who followed the trained seals i thought my role was that of cupid but it begins to look more like captain kidd ah well i'll do my best he stood up i'm going out into the soft moonlight for a little while lord harrowby while i'm gone you might call spencer meyrick up and ask him to do nothing definite in the way of postponement until he hears from me us uh you splinted up you really said harrowby enthusiastically as minot held open the door for him i have the feeling i could fall back on you and i have the feeling that you've fallen smiled minot so long better wait up for my report fifteen minutes later seated in a small rowboat on the starry waters of the harbor minot was loudly saluting the yacht lilith finally mr martin wall appeared at the rail well what do you want he demanded a word with you mr wall minot answered will you be good enough to let down your accommodation ladder for a moment wall hesitated and minot watching him knew why he hesitated he suspected that the young man in the tiny boat there on the calm bright waters had come to repay a call earlier in the evening a call made while the host was out at last he decided to let down the ladder glad to see you he announced genially as minot came on deck awfully nice of you to say that minot laughed reassures me because i've heard there are sharks in these waters they sat down in wicker chairs on the forward deck minot stared at the cluster of lights that was san marco by night corking view you have of that tourist haunted town he commented ah yes mr wall's queer eyes narrowed did you row out here to tell me that he inquired a deserved rebuke minot returned time flies and my errand is a pressing one am i right in assuming mr wall that you are lord harrowby's friend i am good then you will want to help him in the very serious difficulty in which he now finds himself mr wall the man who calls himself the real lord harrowby made his debut on a vaudeville stage to-night <laughs> so i've heard said wall with a short laugh lord harrowby's fiancée and her father are greatly disturbed they insist that this impostor must be removed from the scene at once or there will be no wedding mr wall it is up to you and me to remove him just what is your interest in the matter wall inquired the same as yours i am harrowby's friend now mr wall this is the situation as i see it wanted board and room in a quiet neighborhood for mr george harrowby far from the street cars the vaudeville stage the wedding march and other disturbing elements and what is more i think i've found the quiet neighborhood i think it's right here aboard the lilith oh indeed yes a simple affair to arrange mr wall trimmer and his live proposition are just about due for their final appearance of the night at the opera house right now i will call at the stage door and lead mr trimmer away after his little introductory speech i will keep him away until you and a couple of your sailors i suggest the two i met so informally in the north river 
have met the vaudeville lord at the stage door and gently but firmly persuaded him to come aboard this boat mr wall regarded minot with a cynical smile a clever scheme he said what would you say was the penalty for kidnapping in this state oh why not look it up asked minot carelessly surely martin wall is not afraid of a backwoods constable what do you mean by that my boy said wall with an ugly stare what do you think i mean minot smiled back i'd be very glad to take the role i've assigned you i can't help feeling that it will be more entertaining than the one i have the difficulty in the way is tremor i believe i am better fitted to engage his attention i know him better than you do and he trusts me begging your pardon further he did give me a nasty dig said wall flaming at the recollection the noisy mountebank well my boy your young enthusiasm has won me i'll do what i can and you can do a lot watch me until you see me lead trimmer away then get his pet i'll steer trimmer somewhere near the beach and keep an eye on the lilith when you get george safely aboard wave a red light in the bow then trimmer and i shall part company for the night i'm on said wall rising anything to help harrowby and this won't be the first time i've waited at the stage door right o said minot but don't stop to buy a champagne supper for a train seal will you i don't want to have to listen to mr trimmer all night they rowed ashore in company with two husky members of the yacht's crew and ten minutes later minot was walking with the pompous mr trimmer through the quiet plaza he had told that gentleman that he came from allan harrowby to talk terms and trimmer was puffed with pride accordingly so mr harrowby has come to his senses at last he said well i thought this vaudeville business would bring him round although i must say i'm a bit disappointed down in my heart my publicity campaign has hardly started i had so many lovely little plans for the future say it makes me sad to win so soon sorry laughed minot lord harrowby however deems it best to call a halt he suggests pardon me interrupted mr trimmer grandiloquently as the victor in the contest i shall do any suggesting that is done and what i suggest is this to-morrow morning i shall call upon allan harrowby at his hotel i shall bring george with me also some newspaper friends of mine in front of the crowd allan harrowby must acknowledge his brother as the future heir to the earldom of raybrook why the newspaper men minot inquired publicity said trimmer it's the breath of life to me my business my first love my last frankly i want all the advertisement out of this thing i can get at what hour shall we call you would not consider a delay of a few days minot asked save your breath advised trimmer promptly ah i feared it laughed minot well then, shall we say eleven o'clock you are to call with george harrowby eleven it is said trimmer they had reached a little park by the harbor's edge trimmer looked at his watch and that being all settled i'll run back to the theatre i myself have advised harrowby to his surrender minot began wise boy good night said trimmer moving away not that i have been particularly impressed by your standing as a publicity man continued minot mr trimmer stopped in his tracks as a matter of fact went on minot i never heard of you or any of the things you claim to have advertised until i came to san marco mr trimmer came slowly back up the grave walk in just what inland hamlet untouched by telegraph telephone newspaper and railroad he asked have you been living minot dropped to a handy bench and smiled up into mr trimmer's thin face new york city he replied mr trimmer glanced back at the lights of san marco hesitatingly then it was really a cruel temptation he sat down beside minot on the bench do you mean to tell me 
he inquired that you lived in new york two years ago and didn't hear of cottrell's ink eraser such was my unhappy fate smiled minot then you were in ludlow street jail that's all i've got to say trimmer replied why man what i did for that eraser is famous i rigged up a big electric sign in times square and all night long i had an electric cottrell's erasing indiscreet sentences the kind of things people write when they get foolish with their fountain pens for instance i hereby deed to toffee footlights all my real and personal property and the like it took the town by storm theatrical managers complained that people preferred to stand and look at my sign rather than visit the shows can you look me in the eye and say that you never saw that sign well minot answered i begin to remember a little about it now of course you do mr trimmer gave him a congratulatory slap on the knee and if you think hard probably you can recall my neat little stunt of the prima donna and the cough drops i want to tell you about that he spoke with fervor the story of his brave deeds rose high to shatter the stars apart a half hour passed while his picturesque reminiscences flowed on mr minot sat enraptured his eyes on the harbor where the lilith like a painted ship graced a painted ocean my boy trimmer was saying i have made the public stop look and listen when i get my last publicity in the shape of an in memoriam let them run that tag on my headstone and the story of me that i guess will be told longest after i am gone is the one about the great juice that i he paused his audience was not listening he felt it intuitively mr minot sat with his eyes on the lilith in the bow of that handsome boat a red light had been waved three times mr trimmer minot said your tales are more interesting than the classics he stood some other time i hope to hear a continuation of them just at present lord harrowby or mister if you prefer is waiting to hear what arrangement i have made with you you must pardon me i can talk as we walk along said trimmer and proved it in the middle of the deserted plaza they separated at the dark stage door of the opera house trimmer saw his proposition who do you mean asked the lone stagehand there george lord harrowby insisted mr trimmer ah oh, that bum actor seen him going away a while back with two men that called for him bum actor cried trimmer indignantly he stopped two men who were they the stagehand asked profanely how he could know that and mr trimmer hurriedly departed for the side street boarding-house where he and his fallen nobleman shared a suite about the same time dick minot blithely entered lord harrowby's apartments in the hotel de la pax well he announced you can cheer up little george is painlessly removed he sleeps to-night aboard the good ship lilith thanks to the efforts of martin wall assisted by yours truly he stopped and stared in awe at his lordship what's the matter with you he inquired harrowby waved a hopeless hand minot he said it was good of you but while you have been assisting me so kindly in that quarter another and a greater blow has fallen good lord what cried minot it is no fault of mine harrowby began on which i would have gambled my immortal soul minot said i thought it was all over and done with five years ago i was young sentimental calcium light and grease paint and that sort of thing hit me hard i saw her from the stalls fell desperately in love stayed so for six months wrote letters burning letters and now yes and now now she's here gabrielle rose is here she's here with the letters oh for a cottrell's ink eraser minot groaned my man saw her downstairs went on harrowby mopping his damp forehead fifty thousand she wants for the letters or she gives them to a newspaper and begins to sue at once to-morrow 
i suppose said minot she is the usual gaiety girl not the usual old chap quite a remarkable woman she'll do what she promises trust her and i haven't a farthing minot it's all up now there's no way out of this minot sat thinking the telephone rang i won't talk to her cried harrowby in a panic i won't have anything to do with her minot old chap as a favor to me the old family solicitor smiled minot that's me he took down the receiver but no voice that had charmed thousands at the gaiety answered his instead there came over the wire heated raging the tones of mr henry trimmer hello i want alan harrowby ah that's minot talking isn't it yes good i want a word with you do you know what i think of your methods well you won't now telephone rules in the way think you're going to get ahead of trimmer do you think you put one over eh well let me tell you you're wrong you're in for it now you've played into my hands steal lord harrowby will you do you know what that means publicity do you know what i'll do to-morrow i'll start a cyclone in this town that good night said minot and hung up who was it harrowby wanted to know our friend trimmer on the warpath minot replied it seems he's missed his vaudeville partner he sat down see here harrowby he said it was the first time he had dropped the prefix it occurs to me that an unholy lot of things are happening to spoil this wedding so i'm going to ask you a question yes harrowby minot looked straight into the weak but noble eyes are you on the level really i'm not very expert in your astounding language are you straight honest do you want to be married yourself why minot my dear chap i've told you a thousand times i want nothing more i never shall want anything more all right said minot rising then go to bed and sleep the sleep of the innocent but where are you going what are you going to do i'm going to try and do the same and as he went out minot slammed the door on a pier sticking above the knob on the door of three eight nine he found a telegram turning on his lights he sank wearily down on the bed and tore it open it rained in torrents said the telegram at the dowager duchess's garden party you know what that means it was signed john thacker isn't that a devil of a nightcap muttered minot gloomily End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Love Insurance by Earl Durr Biggers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Ten: Two Birds of Passage. On the same busy night, when the Lilith flashed a red signal and Miss Gabrielle Rose arrived with a package of letters that screamed for a cotrell, two strangers invaded San Marco by means of the eight nineteen freight south frayed fatigued and famished as they were it would hardly have been kind to study them as they strolled up san sebastian avenue toward the plaza but had you been so unkind you would never have guessed that frequently in various corners of the little round globe they had known prosperity the weekly pay envelope and the buyer's crook of the finger summoning a waiter one of the strangers was short with flaming red hair and in his eye the twinkle without which the collected works of bernard shaw are as sounding brass he twinkled about him as he walked at the bright lights and spurious gaiety under the spell of which san marco sought to forget the rates per day with bath the french he mused are a volatile people fond of light wines and dancing so it would seem are the inhabitants of san marco white flannels harry white flannels they should encase that leaning tower of pisa you call your manly form the other long cadaverous immersed in a gentle melancholy groaned 
another tourist hothouse packed with innocents abroad and everybody bleeding em but us everything here but a real home with chintz table covers and a cold roast of beef in the ice chest what are we doing here we should have gone north ah harry chide me no more pleaded the little man i was weak i know but all the freight seemed to be coming south and i have always longed for a winter amid the sunshine and flowers look at this fat old duffer coming alms for the love of allah alms shut up growled the thin one save your breath till we stand hat in hand in the office of the local newspaper a job two jobs good lord there aren't two newspaper jobs in the entire south well we can only be kicked out into the night again and perhaps staked to a meal in the name of the guild in which we have served so long and liquidly some day said the short man dreamily when i am back in the haunts of civilization again i am going to start something a society for melting the stone hearts of editors motto have a heart have a heart emblem a roast beef sandwich rampant on a cloth of linen ah well the day will come they halted in the plaza in the round stone tub provided the town alligator dozed above him hung a warning sign do not feed or otherwise annoy the alligator the short man read and drew back with a tragic groan feed or otherwise annoy he cried heavens harry is that the way they look at it here this is no place for us we'd better be moving on to the next town but the lean stranger gave no heed instead he stepped over and entered into earnest converse with a citizen of san marco in a moment he returned to his companion's side one newspaper he announced the evening chronicle suppose the office is locked for the night but come along let's try feed or otherwise annoy muttered the little man blankly for the love of allah alms they traversed several side streets and came at last to the office of the chronicle it was a modest structure verging on decay one man sat alone in the dim interior reading exchanges under an electric lamp good evening said the short man genially are you the editor uh-huh responded the chronicle man without enthusiasm from under his green eyeshade glad to know you we just dropped in a couple of newspaper men you know this is mr harry howe until recently managing editor of the mobile press my own name is robert o'neill a humble editorial writer on the same sheet uh-huh if you had jobs for god's sake why did you leave them ah you may well ask the red-haired one dropped uninvited into a chair old man it's a dramatic story the chief of police of mobile happened to be a crook and a grafter and we happened to mention it in the press night before last twenty-five armed cops invaded the peace and sanctity of our sanctum harry and i pure accident landed in the same general heap at the foot of the fire escape out back and here we are here we are my newspaper instinct said the chronicle man had already enabled me to gather that last sarcasm it was a bad sign but blithely bob o'neill continued here we are he said two experienced newspaper men down and out we thought there might possibly be a vacancy or two on the staff of your paper the editor threw off his eyeshade revealing a cynical face boys he said i thank you from the bottom of my heart i've been running this alleged newspaper for two long dreary years and this laugh you've just handed me is the first i've had during that time vacancies there is one a big one see my pocket for particulars two years boys and all the time hoping praying that some day i'd make two dollars and sixty cents which is the railroad fare to the next town how and o'neill listened with faces that steadily grew more sorrowful i'd like to stake you to a meal the editor went on but a man's first duty is to his family any burglar will tell you that i suppose ventured o'neill most of the flash gone from his manner there is no other newspaper here 
no there isn't there's a weird thing here called the san marco mail morning outrage it's making money but by different methods than i'd care to use you might try there you look unlucky perhaps they take you on he rose from his chair and gave them directions for reaching the mail office good night boys he said thank you for calling you're the first newspaper men i've seen in two years except when i've looked in the glass and the other day i broke my looking-glass good night and bad luck go with you to the extent of jobs on the mail cynic breathed o'neill in the street a bitter tongue maketh a sour face i liked him not a morning outrage called the mail sounds promising like smallpox in the next county we shall see said howe that which meets our vision forward march the alligator and i muttered o'neill famished perishing for the love of allah as i remarked before alms in the dark second-floor hallway where the mail office was suspected of being they groped about determinedly no sign of any nature proclaimed san marco's only morning paper a solitary light shining through a transom beckoned boldly o'neill pushed open the door to the knowing nostrils of the two birds of passage was wafted the odor they loved the unique inky odor of a newspaper shop their eyes beheld a rather bare room a typewriter or two a desk in the centre of the room was a small table under an electric lamp on this table was a bottle and glasses and at it two silent men played poker one of the men was burly and bearded the other was slight pale nervous from an inner room came the click of linotypes lonesome linotypes that seemed to have strayed far from their native haunts the two men finished playing the hand and looked up good evening said o'neill with a smile that had drawn news as a magnet draws steel in many odd corners gentlemen four newspaper men meet in a strange land i perceive you have on the table a greeting unquestionably suitable the bearded man laughed rose and discovered two extra glasses on a nearby shelf draw up he said heartily the place is yours you're as welcome as payday thanks o'neill reached for a glass let me introduce ourselves and he mentioned his own name and howe's call me mears said the bearded one i'm managing editor of the mail and this is my city editor mr elliot delighted breathed o'neill a pleasant little haven you have found here and your staff i don't see the members of your staff running in and out mr o'neill said mears impressively you have drunk with the staff of the mail you too o'neill's face shone with joy glory be do you hear that harry these gentlemen all alone on the premises he leaned over and poured out eloquently the story of the tragic flight from mobile i call this luck he finished here we are broke eager for work and we find you minus a o'neill stopped for he had seen a sickly smile of derision float across the face of the weary city editor and he saw the bearded man shaking his great head violently nothing doing said the bearded man firmly sorry to dash your hopes always ready to pour another drink but there are no vacancies here no sir two of us are plenty and running over eh bill plenty and running over agreed the city editor warmly into their boots tumbled the hearts of the two strangers in a strange land gloom and hunger engulfed them but the managing editor of the mail was continuing and what was this he was saying no boys we don't need a staff have just as much use for a manicure set but you come at an opportune time wanderlust it tickles the soles of four feet to-night and those four feet are editorial feet on the mail something tells us that we are going away from here boys how would you like our jobs he stared placidly at the two strangers o'neill put one hand to his head see me safely to my park bench harry he said it was that drink on an empty stomach i'm all in a daze i hear strange things i hear em too said howe see here 
he turned to mears are you offering to resign in our favor the minute you say the word both of you believe me said the city editor you can't say the word too soon well said howe i don't know what's the matter with the place but you can consider the deal closed spoken like a sport the bearded man stood up you can draw lots to determine who is to be managing editor and who city editor it's an excellent scheme i attained my proud position that way one condition i attach ask no questions let us go out into the night unburdened with your interrogation points elliot too stood the bearded man indicated the bottle fill up boys i propose a toast to the new editors of the mail may heaven bless them and bring them safely back to the north when florida's fitful fever is past dizzily uncertainly howe and o'neill drank mr mears reached out a great red hand toward the bottle pardon me private property he said he pocketed it we bid you good-bye and good luck think of us on the choo-choo please riding far riding far but see here cried o'neill but me no buts said mears again nary a question i beg of you take our jobs and if you think of us at all think of gleaming rails and a speeding train once more good-bye the door slammed o'neill looked at howe fairies he muttered or the dt's what is this a comic opera or a town you are managing editor harry i shall be city editor is there a city to edit no matter no said howe he reached for the greasy pack of cards we draw for it come on high winds jack announced mr o'neill deuce smiled howe what are your orders sir o'neill passed one hand before his eyes a steak he muttered well done mushroom sauce french fried potatoes i've always dreamed of running a paper some day hurry up with that steak forget your stomach said howe if a subordinate may make a suggestion we must get out a newspaper ah whom have we here a stocky red-faced man appeared from the inner room and stood regarding them where's mears and elliot he demanded on a train riding far said o'neill i am the new managing editor what can i do for you you can get me four columns of copy for the last page of tomorrow's mail said the stocky man calmly i'm foreman of something in there we call a composing room glad to meet you four columns mused o'neill four columns of what the foreman pointed to a row of battered books on a shelf it's been the custom he said to fill up with stuff out of that encyclopedia there thanks o'neill answered he took down a book we'll fix you up in ten minutes mr howe will you please do me two columns on an uh, mulligatawny murder mushrooms that's it on mushrooms life story of the humble little mushroom i myself will dash off a column or so on the climate of algeria the foreman withdrew and howe and o'neill stood looking at each other once said o'neill i ran an editorial page in boston where you can always fill space by printing letters from citizens who wish to rewrite lincoln's gettysburg address and do it right but i never struck anything like this before me either said howe mushrooms did you say they sat down before typewriters one thing worries me remarked o'neill if we'd asked the president of the first national bank for jobs do you suppose we'd be in charge there now right man right said howe the clatter of their fingers on the keys filled the room they looked up suddenly ten minutes later to find a man standing between them he was a little man clad all in white suit shoes stockings his sly old face was lemon yellow and his eyes suggested lights flaming in the dark woods at night beg pardon said the little man ah and what can we do for you inquired o'neill nothing mr mears mr elliot gone vamost you are now speaking to the managing editor of the mail 
ah indeed we are very busy if you'll just tell me what you want i merely dropped in i am manuel gonzale owner of the mail good lord cried o'neill do not be disturbed i take it you gentlemen have replaced mears and elliot i am glad let them go you look like bright young men to me quite bright enough i employ you thanks stammered the managing editor don't mention it here is madame on this for to-morrow it runs on the first page as for the rest of the paper suit yourselves o'neill took the copy and glanced through it are there no libel laws down here he asked the material in that column said the little man his eyes narrowing concerns only me you must understand that at once the madam writes hot stuff ventured o'neill i am the madam said the owner of the mail with dignity he removed the copy from o'neill's hand and glided with it into the other room scarcely had he disappeared when the door was opened furiously and a panting man stood inside mr henry trimmer's keen eye surveyed the scene where's mears elliot he cried you're not the cashier are you asked o'neill with interest don't try to be funny roared trimmer i'm looking for the editor of this paper your search is ended o'neill replied what is it you mean you say i got a front-page story for tomorrow's issue that will upset the town come to my arms cried o'neill what is it the real lord harrowby has been kidnapped o'neill stared at him sorrowfully have you been reading the duchess again he asked who the hell is lord harrowby do you mean to say you don't know where have you been buried alive out of the inner room glided manuel gonzale and recognizing him mr trimmer poured into his ear the story of george's disappearance mr gonzale rubbed his hands a good story he said a very good story thank you a thousand times i myself will write it with a scornful glance at the two strangers mr trimmer went out and manuel gonzale sat down at his desk o'neill and howe returned to their encyclopedic dispatches there you are said gonzale at last standing put an eight-column head on that please and run it on the front page a very fine story the paper must go to press he looked at a diamond-studded watch in an hour only four pages please see to the make-up my circulation manager will assist you with the distribution at the door he paused it occurs to me that your exchequer may be low seventy-five dollars a week for the managing editor fifty for the city editor allow me ten dollars each in advance if you need more pray remind me into their hands he put crinkling bills and then gliding still like the fox he looked he went out into the night sister cried o'neill weakly the fairies are abroad to-night i heard the rustle of their feet over the grass fairies sneered howe i could find another and a harsher name for them don't pleaded o'neill don't look a gift bill in the treasury number don't try to penetrate behind the beyond say nothing and let us eat how are you coming with the mushroom cereal an hour later they sent the paper to press and sought the grill room of the hotel alameda as they came happily away from that pleasant spot o'neill spied a fruit stand he stopped and made a few purchases now said howe let us go over and meet the circulation manager here where are you going bob just a minute o'neill shouted back come along harry i'm going over to the plaza i'm going over to feed that alligator End of chapter ten